Hello and welcome to Build Back Liberal. This time I'm joined by not one but two Liberal Democrat Chief Executives. The Chief Executive of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, uh, Rachel Palmer Randall, and the Chief Executive of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, Claire Halliwell. Hello. Hi. Hi, Ryan. So if I start with Rachel, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and sort of your journey to becoming uh, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Liberal Democrats? Gosh, this is where it makes you feel very old all, all of a sudden. Um, I, my first job that I got with the, with the party was as a, a researcher, assistant, volunteer, um, a RISO person for uh, Evan Harris in Oxford West and Abingdon. Um, and that was your classic, uh, come and work for me, but I can't pay you internship uh, some time ago. Um, and from then I sort of, I got caught up in in the Liberal Democrats with this group of people who seem to reflect my views. And I did a long stay of campaigning and um, uh, roles in terms of Dorset campaigns officer, campaigns manager for London, um, sort of surviving each general election and, 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 and moving on. I've also done some work, I was head of the leader's office in capital culture in Liverpool. Um, I worked with the Liberal Democrat group in Brussels for the LGA. Um, and sort of ricocheted my way through different parts of the organisation. Um, most recently being a director for the Federal Party in 2017, I'm going to say, and then taking on this role as Chief Executive uh, of Scottish Liberal Democrats in June of uh, last year, so just six months ago. Fantastic. And Claire, same question. <laughs> um, similarly had a, a range of roles I think I'll call it within the party um, I started uh, with a paid internship rare as they are um, uh, on a th three month contract um, and have stayed 12 years so um, you know I have worked uh, for four members of parliament um, and do, uh, primarily been uh, either an organiser there or did casework as well um, and then went and moved uh, and, and worked for the Association of Liberal Democrat Councillors and was campaigns and HQ team manager there before moving on to work for LDHQ uh, for the past two years and then um, ran Ed Davies' successful leadership uh, campaign this year before moving on to be Chief Executive of the Welsh Liberal Democrats. So if we rolled back five years, the Liberal Democrats um, out of 57 MPs, only seven were female. There were very few women in very senior campaigns roles in the party. I think Hilary Stevenson was a lone exception. Yeah. Um, there had been very, there were very few women in senior um, behind the scenes elected roles in the party. And in a very short space of time, super fit, that seems to have changed, at least in that sort of what the output of women in post. We have, we've had a female leader, we've had a more diverse parliamentary party, uh, we've had more women in senior director roles at HQ. Currently the chairs of the English, Scottish and Welsh Liberal Democrats are women, and obviously yourselves as chief executives. Um, the tongue-in-cheek question would be to say, does that mean we fix the problem? Um, but perhaps uh, more generally, what is the significance of this change and where is their work still going on? I think the tongue in cheek answer would be um, yes, it's all perfectly fine. And, 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 and Claire and I are obviously the solution to whatever the problem initially was. Um, I think probably for me, it's about more continuous sustained efforts on these fronts. And rather, I mean, Claire and I aren't in our positions, nor are the chairs of the, lo of the state parties because of our gender or because of some massive effort to try and change things. We've sort of done these things, achieved these things. Other women in the party have done things despite the organisation, not because of it in lots of ways. So I think we need to build other pathways for other people and that's you know, race, gender, um, ethnicity, all sorts of elements, not just um, being sort of defined by ovaries. But I think part of this is about, you can't be, I think, a wallflower, um, it, it's very difficult in working environment uh, and if you're um, 
if you're not robust, if you don't have the network around you of other peers and people to support you, encourage you and tell you, yes, of course you can do these things. It would be very easy to falter. So we think, I think we need better support mechanisms and more overt pathways to senior positions. Whereas I very much feel like it's been this ricochet kind of ping ponging, but just by chance finding myself somewhere opportunity rather than uh, concerted effort by the party. Definitely, I fully agree with Rachel. I mean, I, I think um, I'm lucky I've worked for a female parliamentarian and I think I've also been represented at every level of government uh, by a, a female. And I think that's really rare for so many people that actually I've never thought of somebody standing for elective office and being a female as being unusual. But actually, as you say, those behind the scenes uh, roles actually are ha have been at various points rare within the party. I have turned up to many a, a, a you know, a, a weekend away with fellow organisers, etc. And being one of the few female organisers. Um, but I don't necessarily feel like I've been differently um, and I as Rachel says actually part of it is about having a peer group around you that, that encourages you to take that next step uh, encourages you to stand um, and think about the roles um, and you know maybe we do them slightly differently but equally I'm not the first female chief executive here, here in Wales either um, so it's just that not necessarily everybody realizes those roles and that actually as you said rightly that um, you know the, the, the state chairs and, and convener at the moment are females. I actually think that's probably not that well known within our party. And no, we, and we've got to do more, a bigger job of actually shouting about that success and the difference that they're all making. I'd say if I just chip in on that, Claire, what you're saying, I think we get, uh, when we talk about gender in the party, we talk very much about putting um, bottoms on green benches and not what leadership looks like at all levels so there's lots of women who work in campaigns for the charity sector but don't segue across to party politics and um, we need female chairs of local parties we need female chairs of regional parties and state parties is happening right now but it's leadership at different levels if you want to change the dynamics of our whole organization not just parliament obviously the party is not a monolithic organization it is a family a community of different organizations and levels but would you say the party is a good employer for women is it a place that uh, is welcoming to women or is it somewhere where we have a lot more to do to create a culture that is suitable a good place for women to work I think everybody's experience is ever so slightly different. Um, I admit I don't have children um, and I'm not married. And I think sometimes that actually my experience might be might be different than than, than Rachel's, for example. Um, I think we still have a way to go, but I actually think we have a way to go with all of the different roles within as a former organizer, for example. You know, there's there's lots of best practice which we we can. That, that there is out there but not that that's not being replicated should I say throughout um, the party as a whole uh, and I know myself and Rachel have tried to make a bit more of a concerted effort to make sure that that best practice is shared um, and I'm sure Rachel will talk about it more but actually like I read a really fascinating article um, about um, Biden's campaign manager who was a, a female um, Jen O'Malley Dillon I think is her name and um, she'd spoken about actually saying to, to fellow staff members that actually this time is my time and you're not touching it because that's when I put the kids to bed or, or whatever or I do this activity that I want to do and I think sometimes we're too frightened at all you know regardless of gender of actually saying stop I need some personal time I need some time away from the campaign and I think we have a duty of care there to make sure that everybody's actually having that time away from whatever their role is um, so yeah there's more to do um, and as you say it varies sadly too often around the party yeah I mean I think this is the, the piece of work that Claire and I have been working on with Wendy Chamberlain has been with her new role as um, chief whip has been trying to have this sort of when they say people say you're involved you're employed by the party that I mean that's a myriad of different employers and I like we know some managers are really good and amazing and the people you always aspire to and think my god that was the brilliant person some people are just dreadful and don't have the personal skills or managerial skills so we've been pulling together sort of a best practice uh, set of 
guidance. I mean, it's effectively a glorified Google Doc that all staff and um, managers have access to um, within Wales and Scotland specifically. So whether you're um, Alistair Carmichael's parliamentary researcher or your uh, Alex Cole Hamilton's uh, PA in Holyrood, that you're part of the Lib Dem umbrella. And that doesn't mean it's like everybody has the exact, you know, nine to five routine and the one to ones and the contracts. Um, but it says these are standards that we believe everybody should be employed to. And you sh if you want to do a, a performance review, here, here's a template so you're not making it up. And if something's going wrong, here's another template for having those conversations. And we've done quite a lot of work around mental health action plans as well to make sure that in the run up to the election, which we know is quite a brutal time for everybody, volunteers, organisers and uh, campaign and candidates, is how do you look after yourself? How do you see the signs of poor mental health when those boundaries between um, work-life balance whether you've got small children in the background and you're homeschooling or you're alone in your bedroom in lockdown um how does that impact on you and how can we help so tiny steps um but, but the report card would say must must do better but hopefully i think we're making some progress and can i just add i would say like actually as both myself and rachel have had so many different roles within the party actually we bring that to the table that actually we yeah. know what it's like to be a sole uh, organizer um in the middle of in essence nowhere without the same level of support but we also are aware of what it's like to be an ldhq and, and it, it really does vary massively but we're also trying to bring in that parliamentary aspect to it as well and, and i think that's um you know a, hopefully will be a move forward for the party in more general terms implicit in that question is the idea about the party as an employer irrespective of gender and um, as we yeah. say there's a very variable experience um I think one thing I find too striking is how isolating many people can be in the party with lots of staff working remotely in the field, sometimes without access to uh, close access to managers or to uh, people with experience in paid roles who can support them. So there's kind of the experience between working in Lipton HQ in London, between working for different parliamentarians and working yeah. in the field is so varied. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and we get that. I've been the lonely one by the riso with not seeing anybody in the constituency office for days vis-a-vis -vis the camaraderie you get in LDHQ or Clifton Terrace. So this is a big election year for Lib Dems, although you might not have necessarily noticed it in many parts of the country, but we're going to be having devolved elections in Scotland, in Wales, the mayoral election in London, this is actually a, a year where there are going to be elections of some kind or other across vast waves of the country with significant uh, impact on people's lives. Why are these, it seems churlish to say why are these elections important because they always are, but what do you think is going to be significant about this set of devolved elections particularly? So first of all, I like the assumption that these elections are going ahead. That's the one that I want to keep in mind. And I don't want any of the speculation of, oh, what do you think? And who do, like, we have to, um, for, for sanity and for planning sake, we have to assume that the elections are going ahead uh, across uh, the UK and all the different guises on, on May 6th. Um, for Scotland, it's, it, it's, it's a huge election. Um, it's all up elections, uh, a list and constituency. Um, and, uh, you know, we said about being churlish. I mean, the, the goal is to put more yellow on a map. I mean, that's the goal across the UK. More big blobs that can be seen on a Jon Snow map rather than little blobs, but big blobs. Um, but really, in Scotland, it's about building infrastructure. Um, obviously, back in the 56 MPs days, there were more MSPs, there were more MPs, there was more infrastructure. So that when you come to a general election you're not suddenly pouring resources into an area that has no organizer who's been in place for the last six months 18 months two years like they don't have the delivery rounds that don't have the networks that don't have the people so um devolved elections whilst not necessarily on the radar of every liberal democrat in the country are those pathways and stepping stones those tier two seats that could be the next seats 
for the Westminster elections. And obviously, with, from a Scotland point of view, um, this is about attempting to prevent NDUF2 and the breakup of the United Kingdom. And we've our members are very passionate about Brexit and everything that's just happened there. The exact same thing is likely to happen in our own shores um, in the next few years if we don't take a concerted effort in Scotland to be the voice against the SNP and nationalism. So there's there's quite a lot of factors going in there. So no pressure for the next hundred odd um, days. Yeah, and I've got a, a slightly different experience, I suppose, in many ways that actually we've only, well, we've got a minister here in Wales elected. Um, and I don't think enough is made of that fact, both internally in Wales or, or more broadly within the party, that actually Kirsty Williams, um, as Minister of Education, has been doing an absolutely fantastic job. She moved quicker on uh, so many decisions than um, those that, you know, in, in Westminster. And um, I think, sadly, our party will be poor, poorer for, for not having her um, elected after next May. Um, but we only have uh, one member of the Senate currently. So again, this is used, being used as a, a test of where we are as a party in Wales. Um, how do we build, re, you know, really rebuild um, and making sure that we do have representation. We're using it a lot as well for how do we get those resources on the ground for thinking about 2022, which is when our all out local elections are as well. So good showings next year could really, really, uh, well this year, sorry, could really, really uh, make sure that, you know, 2022 is also a success here in Wales. Implicit in what each of you have been saying is that these elections, the, a success isn't just uh, more elected people at the end of it, that there is a wider objective in what which wider objectives to just um going from one synod member to two in wales <laughs> or you know increasing the size of scottish parliamentary party that uh the election uh that you want a legacy from this result that can be built on in a whole host of other elections in future can you talk more about uh what what that looks like and how how important that is and what you'll try how what kind of things that might look like and what you're trying to achieve if i go first yeah, okay. go, yeah um, sure. um, so we're we're targeting um obviously Buckingham Radisher will be no surprise to anybody but also the regional seats so um and that actually means that fundamentally a liberal democrat can do work wherever they live um, not only does this help in COVID times, um, but it should leave us with a legacy of deliverers throughout Wales and not just in those areas that have been considered areas of strength. Now, I'm not saying we don't target. Um, we, we're using an island approach, making sure that each area knows what its islands or island is in its constituency. You know, where should it be focusing any activity? But actually, because um, for the regional seats, there are more proportional uh, voting system, actually, there is an advantage to regardless of, of your vote, uh, you know, your, and your activity, actually, it should all make an impact. And we're talking a lot like they are in Scotland about not just delivering everywhere once, but actually making sure that these islands have multiple uh, deliveries to them, making sure that we're really going after the votes there. So to leave us with the legacy of what can we do in 2022 in those areas, because it's not going to be the first time that they've ever heard from a Liberal Democrat, or at least, you know, it won't be the first time that they've heard from us since the general election. Um, so yeah, it's about using the resources we have and the people we have um, in certain areas, but also recognising that if there is a Liberal Democrat some, somewhere that wants to do something, actually we're giving them the, the resources they, they need. So there's a massive training programme both federally um, here in Wales and through ALDC, and we're encouraging all of our members to take up that offer, learn something and actually put it into action in their areas. Um, and it's sort of going back to the pick a ward and win it, but we're trying to pick up regions and win them. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 100 percent. It's it. That's exactly exactly the situation mirrored in, in Scotland. The list system gives an opportunity. We don't have to be as high in the polls uh, as you do for constituency seats. So that gives us opportunity um, now. We also have um, the training programmes to, again, give people 
upskill people irrespective of where they are and oddly an upside of covid is an ability to be able to have more people engaged online in doing training like aldc uh, federally the stuff the bespoke stuff we're building in scotland so it's about building that infrastructure because i think if we look at um the membership in scotland particularly it hasn't boomed but it hasn't bust um it's steady but it hasn't grown and there's obviously a massive opportunity to grow because um, lots of people are, uh, many hundreds and uh, thousands of people are members of the SNP. So there is an opportunity for us to grow, but it's trying to build up outside of those castle areas and build them out. So again, like uh, Claire is talking about, our, our structure is one about finding 2022 targets and ensuring that they are the places we are targeting with literature this year so that we build up a slow um, a sort of a community politics but at a much more wider regional um, level so yeah that's 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 the hope and aspiration i think this ties to a sort of a long-standing irony in that the liberal democrats are passionately in favor of proportional representation but have perhaps historically not been the best at fighting elections that are proportional um, <laughs> with the exception of the most recent euro elections we've tended to do worse in elections with an element of proportionality than we've had in terms of um uh, like vote shares we get in westminster elections um so the uh fact that you're trying to adapt tactics that are suitable for that i think is really really val valuable work because i think uh we we need as well as how it can benefit uh, the long term of our parliamentary elections we just need to be better at this kind of election because if we are ever successful at getting wider change in how we think it would be a real shame if we then started to lose even worse well i, I think as well like <laughs> yes, for, for you know local elections in scotland are already run on a, a proportional system um, here in Wales they've just given uh, the councils the power to decide that I'm not only convinced that every every council in Wales will rush to it primarily because there's a self-interest element to that um, but we are definitely moving uh, in different ways in that direction um, and the other thing I'd actually add is about staffing up you know lots of people are discussing about you know oh well we need more staff and, and, and stuff like that and Wales is a prime example you know we've gone from two members of staff to eight which is a significant difference lots of those are part-time not everybody's full-time but actually if we take out the staff members what happens then so a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment is making sure that there, we are should our contracts etc not be extended that actually there is a, a lasting legacy here of activity that members can do uh, they, they've taken on the challenge of running a, a regional campaign um, and making sure that we're working more closely with volunteers to ensure that they've got the skills should should the staff member be removed it won't all come crumbling down yeah and I think picking up on your point Ryan there as well about you know we often advocate for something in a, an electoral sense and then sort of miss the step on how we actually achieve that thereafter and I think we do need to upskill and i think that's where we need to have the opportunity to be able to just pilot some stuff try some things um dare i say fail at some stuff because there's there's only there's always a big bang moment which is a general election where you sort of at that perfect moment a bit like a parliamentary by-election all the money comes in and you get a message and you get people and it all comes together in a beautiful crescendo and it either works or doesn't and history tells us right now it doesn't um and it falls away again and then we start again and actually having a continuous cycle of piloting trying i'm not suggesting we use the good burgers of the state parties as guinea pigs for the liberal democrats but we you know there are some things we could try out we can do some things and then we can say go back to donors go back to stakeholders and say ah yeah you said that our, ex our experience says that doesn't work but i tell you what did work it was this and that might be mobilization that might be membership re recruitment and retention that might be community politic campaigning or stv voting on a list system it could be anything but there's some there's a real opportunity that we and a, and a gap that we need to fill i think in terms of being less risk averse how can we as a party get better at this kind of long-term thinking with our campaigning more generally i think there does seem to be a a lack of sustainability to lots of ways in which we do go about our campaigning 
very much boom and bust cycles with staffing, yeah. with resource, um, understandable about when donations come in, but ensuring that there is a plan for continuity of progress with a lot of things. Uh, I mean, we've, um, I think what really uh, struck me was um, uh, a very specific example would be the Whitney by-election was a wonderful success for the party. Uh, but my I, my awareness is that actually they dropped down to third place in the following general election. They didn't have more any kind of ongoing support and resource put in. That's now been remedied. They're on a very good path to success, I understand. But there's there's kind of that tension in some of this party in that there's big moments that we really focus on, but perhaps how can we turn those into sustained success? Yeah, I mean, if life was just one constant glorious parliamentary by-election I'd be oddly happy because that's when it all comes together you get all your best colleagues together you get everything all together the best candidates you get the best people together and the whole party mobilizes it has one single focus one single objective and it executes it brilliantly right so I would oddly I, I would oddly like that I think it's, it's about I think just training I think we've all talked ourselves we all know if you've been to any ALDC training or any federal party training it's like looking at elections as a continual cycle of election and it's not just one election it's a series of thereafter I think probably the people we need to educate most I don't think we do that federally I think we're trying to do and there's more coordination but there is still this always perception and we've done it Claire and I have done it in LDHQ where your eye is only on Westminster your eye is only on Parliament um, but also there's an opportunity where we can teach the donors about what the significant milestones around the way are because um, you know what does the parliamentary party look like if we've only got members from England um, we have to have members from Wales you know a quarter of the parliamentary party it happened at this moment to be Scottish if we want to go back to 56 MPs then we need to have more Scottish MPs we used to be in coalition in Scotland so we can get there but it's about educating not just the sort of the activist the public and our donors that it's not just a one direction focus that and, and explaining why they're important and not just give us your money now and you won't have any further general election but explaining what it looks like how that builds credibility how that builds us you know Kirsty doing things on education mm. has a phenomenal impact Willie being a really well-known leader for the last 10 years in Scotland gives us credibility in Scotland there's lots of different things we can piece together but it's this um it's this glib thing that I call one team, one dream, which we don't always live as an organisation and with one single um, objective, which is putting yellow on a map. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> um, I fully agree with Rachel. I mean, I think I think using those like the elections, the devolved elections and local elections are always milestones for testing and for seeing where the party is at. And I think um, sadly, too rarely we use them as those. And actually, we have a great document in the Thornhill Review um, in that, you know, that tells us some of the lessons that we need to go away with and i you know i really do hope that i know here in wales um part of my job is making sure that we're being held accountable to that document and how are we implementing it and how are we seeing each election as important in, in its own right and, and and making sure that we're putting the resources on the ground you know even at its most basic we've got a, a potentially depending upon what happens with covid um but we've got by-elections on the way how are we as a party using those council by-elections to build our bases in in Wrexham for example um, you know and giving them some level of, of support or or advice um, that maybe hasn't happened in in most recent years um, so I think just making sure that we we see everything as an opportunity um, and you know are determined to fight them as Liberal Democrats and hopefully win them as Liberal Democrats as well I would just also add finally that actually Wales, the Scottish Party and the Welsh Party have recognised the necessity to put structures in and have CEOs responsible for building sustainability. Most as Claire and I would like to go and play with lots of campaigning. We do need to keep, keep an eye more on the infrastructure, the money, the people and the membership. And that's the recognition of the state parties that if we're going to get to one goal, 
the state parties need to raise their game as well. I think from my, my own experience, I spent time as a PPC and the model that as a candidate you're always aspiring to are the Lynn Featherstons and Norma Lambs of the world who took somewhere from nowhere and built it up steadily over time. Mm. But I think the party's ability to support that and the advice available and the training available, but just generally the, the feeling, but also the sense that this is a worthwhile, valuable thing that you're doing has at times been weaker. And I hope that this kind of, of initiative can support more people who want to take that journey and are willing to put that work in to be able to do so. Absolutely. Yeah, I fully really agree. I mean, I've, I've been lucky in inverted commas to have worked in Stockport for six years before um, moving down south. And, you know, we wouldn't have had the parliamentary gains there unless we'd actually had a really decent local election base. Um, and, you know, at the time of um, various elections, we've been running the council and, you know, we've, we have two MPs from, from uh, Stockport. And you know, we have to realise that it, it isn't just what happens at a parliamentary level, that actually, fundamentally, we need to support all of our candidates. And, you know, not every candidate next uh, this May is going to be successful. I wish they were. But we need to make sure that they are, they know what path they can go on and that they're properly supported going forward. And that, again, even for, for those candidates, that we don't just hold them up for you know, until May and then go, right, we'll see you again in four years time, yeah. <laughs> actually knowing what path there is for them to, um, or five years time, knowing what path there is for them to see success in, in their political careers, you know, is it about actually some of them need to go and become councillors first, um, actually quite a few of mine are already councillors, but, um, you know, do they want to become group leader, do they actually want to become a uh, you know want to run for Westminster as opposed to the Senate or do they are they happy to stand in however many years for the next Senate election um, so I think it's incumbent on the parties to not lo lose candidates um, or volunteers uh, and you know if we need to support everybody better uh, and help them on the on you know their path to hopefully winning at some point um, but yeah you're right it's it's really difficult to try and replicate what what Lynn and Norman have done um, and unless there's you know a bag of money somewhere or as I keep calling it I don't have a magic money tree I wish I did no. um, but we do need to be there are different ways of supporting people it's not always I wish I, I you know we're always looking for money but um, <laughs> it, it you know there is other support that's at, that, that can be provided um, so yeah I think yeah it's, it's sort of difficult um, and sort of to think about long term so uh, an example that strikes me is that myself and uh, one other person Emily Firmer were the only under only people under 30 to get more than 10% in 2017 and neither of us were standing in 2019 so sort of sustaining people who are uh, wanting to progress and do things in the party uh, to feel supported to be able to carry on uh, that is is an ch ongoing challenge I hope that we can do better with it and it's the same with staff like myself and Rachel wouldn't be sat here um if if various people along the way had encouraged us um to stick with the party and and you know keep going and actually there's always that slight brain drain when staff leave um and it and it's often you know such a shame not that people shouldn't look outside the party but actually you do need some level of um knowledge and experience um, and we have to recognise that with, with staff and candidates and volunteers that actually there is value in having experience too. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that challenge really stood out in 2019 when the party did suddenly have an opportunity to do very well, was trying to make the most of that and found that it couldn't get access to the staff it needed because yeah. it had lost so much um, of that infrastructure, of the relationships of people. And actually be able to bring in skilled people quickly is very difficult and uh, there are yeah. only so many people out there who can do what you you do um and uh and it tends to take time to learn all of those things that you've learned over that time so how we can support people to have sustainable careers either in the lib dems or adjacent to the lib dems where we have that talent pool that we can always draw on is also i think 
uh, a key yeah. ingredient in long term. Yeah, with, without having to have the same sort of, you know, you have to stay here for 12, 20 odd years in order to get any successful progress. So there needs to be that constitutional and um, continual institutional knowledge that comes through. So it doesn't mean one person, you rest all your laurel, all your responsibility on one person who, who you now have to be brilliant and have to now do another 10 cycles of elections in order to move forward, but that we have a cycle and a, and a group of people that move forward continually. Um, and yeah, I think that, I think that's really crucial. So in this series, uh, I've asked the same question to um, everyone I've interviewed. Uh, it's sort of hard to ignore the, the big political event across the Atlantic. We had a US election um, and the US election is kind of the gold standard of all campaigning in terms of the sheer amount of money and resource that they have to play with. They have, you know, when we talk about budgets in the thousands, they talk about things in the millions and even the billions of dollars. So as avid campaigners you all have watched closely i'm sure lots of things happening <laughs> over there um is there any sort of what what would be one lesson or idea that you've seen or that you would like to take away from that experience that we might be able to learn from as liberal democrats so obviously we're speaking to you just um a few days after what happened in georgia um and i think we can you know while some of it is not replicable we're, we're lucky in many ways we don't have to worry as much about registration but actually stacy abrams has taken a decade to get where she's got um and i think we have to realize that not everything can be resolved within a, a single electoral cycle and that that's taken the mass mobilization of many many volunteers and i dread to think how much money and how much time and you know resources um but i think how they have managed to do that and kept very very focused on that georgia will be blue um is actually something we need to to learn and, and not just go well they didn't win it within one cycle um actually we need the longer outlook um and we need to think about those like we were saying milestones for how we get there um and you know i i um i'm both thankful for that as a as a thing to look at and think well you can't change everything overnight but actually the idea that something will take a decade or longer actually is also um, i imagine frightening to a lot of, of lots of campaigners but i think um you know i think it's given me some focus for, for what we're trying to both do that actually mm. these things won't happen overnight yeah, I, I totally agree with that, I think, and hopefully there'll be much more information coming out in the weeks, I and mean, it's only come a five days or so since since that result is, I'm not sure it's even technically verified, but um, we won't go there right now. <laughs> I mean, I think hopefully we'll learn a lot more lessons there. I mean, I think the thing I think about the biden Kamala harris uh, campaign is the same as Claire, really from a mobilisation um, point of view. I'm really very interested in how they utilized Slack to mobilize their organizers. Um, I was reading uh, an article about it um, a couple of days ago and realized that I don't think we're gonna get 200,000 activists in Slack in Scotland this May. I think that's unlikely. Um, but it, I think in a COVID time, um, in a digital age, uh, I think there's a sort of Venn diagram comes together of a tool that we could utilize to mobilize people across a large geographical space, whether you're in Orkney or whether you're in Edinburgh, to have a sense of uh, involvement, camaraderie, and, and that side of things. So in Scotland, we're trying to set up a volunteer wing uh, from this month, and primarily I want to utilize Slack as the mechanism by which we keep both staff and members, activists engaged together. The Federal Party has moved to a Slack model for staffing, which I think has been quite useful, particularly in COVID times. Um, but I, wanted, I want to trial bringing in volunteers, which changes that dynamic um, to enable us to be able to have, you know, more digital minions for our shared member of staff, Ryan Cairns. We want to have more people who'd be able to come and help us in physicality in Edinburgh, should we ever be allowed to go and see each other in an office environment again. So the, the Slack tool, some of it, I don't think we can implement in the same way that they did in America. Um, but I think there's little tidbits that we can take that would really help 
member mobilization engagement i think that's a really cool key learning point from from your action i think uh, particularly your example claire there's um been i think i've seen on twitter some emails that stacy abrams was sending to um the dcc yeah. in 2010 2011 yeah. about yeah. i want they to put together a 10-year plan yeah and they actually yeah. did it which yes yeah. is really uh, I, I, well that's the thing as well like she has relentlessly you know i i love at the moment the quote i think it's i'm not an optimist i'm not optimistic i'm not pessimistic but i am determined and mm, i think nice. that sort of absolutely underlines where so many of us are actually within the party that actually we are determined to see more liberal democrats get elected at every level um and you know but and we do sort of have to have a relentless gaze admittedly we also have myself and Rachel have to worry about the pennies and the people and all the rest of it our job isn't just about um uh, necessarily the campaign uh, but it's a, a broader um thing but fundamentally we all need to know what the objective is um and, and you know think about how we get there um and you know uh, ho hopefully it's going to see a you know the world slight, slightly moving and um but you know, at least if America's not not going mad, um, there might be some hope elsewhere. So I think I think St uh, Stacey Abrahams is a stunning example of leadership as well, right? Yeah. You put yourself forward to be the president of the United States, and rather than just step back and say, "Oh, I didn't do it," you go right. Well, I'm now going to continue absolutely and execute and use my power and my the money that I've attracted to execute this ambition. I think it, I, I just think it's phenomenal. I think it's a yeah hopefully a very positive uh 2021 post um pandemic place to be so, yeah brilliant uh thank you both very much for joining me and uh thank you to everyone for listening to build back liberal uh, take care and stay safe <laughs>